Welcome everyone to the Center for Global Development platform. Uh, I'm Amanda Glassman. I'm the executive vice president and a senior fellow that works on global health here at the center. And today we're really pleased to run an event to talk about um, future pandemic risks. Now it's hard to talk about future pandemic risks. We're in the middle of an existing pandemic risk. And, and we'll come back to that a bit in the discussion that we'll have after the presentations today. Um, you know, we all remember uh, how unexpected in some respects uh, coronavirus seemed, but in fact, uh, many groups who had been working on pandemic risks uh, had, had signaled that coronavirus was a major, though uh, potentially infrequent threat, um, but it was certainly there lurking. So the question is, how can we do better at assessing pandemic risk going forward? What is, when, when can we expect the next uh, outbreak and from what source? Um, in general, uh, there has been this idea that this is once in a century, once in a lifetime, but unfortunately, uh, the, the circumstances that lead to spillover events, zoonotic spillovers between animals and human populations are increasing in frequency. So we'll talk today with two groups that are engaged in, in this effort to uh, look at the threat of pandemic risks in the future. And, and also sort of ways to use that information to plan better and respond better in the future. Um, so we'll first be joined with a group from uh, Metabiota, uh, Ben Oppenheim and Nicole uh, Stevenson. Um, they've been working uh, very diligently uh, in support of um, a high level independent panel that had been convened on financing the future of pandemic preparedness and response. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn that over to them, and they'll be followed with um, a group from uh, African Risk Capacity, which is a specialized body of the African Union, Mr. Robert uh, Giarco and his colleague, uh, Dr. Nic uh, sorry, Dr. Christina Steffen, who will talk uh, through the efforts that they've made. And then we'll follow up with Dean Jameson, who is uh, a professor emeritus of Global Health at the University of California, and worked with Larry Summers and Victoria Fan on a really important paper that looked at the threat of pandemic influenza in the future and, and what that would mean from both an epidemiological but also an economic perspective uh, to sort of wrap up this series of presentations. So I'll turn it over now to Ben and Nicole, thanks. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you uh, everyone for joining us for this conversation. We're delighted to get to share some of our work, Let's see if I can make the screen sharing work properly. Um, as Amanda mentioned, uh, pandemics are widely viewed as a, um, as, as a highly infrequent threat. And generally speaking, that's, that's true, although they're perhaps uh, more frequent than is, than is sometimes um, believed. Um, COVID has been talked about as a once in a generation or once in a, once in a century pandemic. Um, all the evidence that we have to date really suggests otherwise. Um, for many of us, this is the third or fourth pandemic we've lived through, certainly the most severe, but the empirical data um, across the board suggest an acceleration of risk in, in a number of different ways. Um, pathogens that we already know about um, and have, uh, have faced in, in numerous outbreaks appear to be spilling over more frequently and generating larger outbreaks. Um, Ebola virus is an iconic example. And we're seeing as well continued spillover of novel pathogens, new threats, which require um, new efforts uh, to surveil and, and mitigate and contain. Um, that's the empirical story. And we'll spend some time talking about uh, some analytical work we've done with empirical data. Um, the modeling work that, uh, that my colleagues specialize in um, applies techniques from epidemiological modeling and catastrophe modeling to estimate the frequency and severity of, um, of future pandemics. And that modeling work um, shows uh, fairly clearly that a COVID level event, um, an event of this magnitude or worse, uh, is, is much more likely to occur in the future than is generally generally appreciated. Certainly not a once in a century um, problem, uh, would, would that it were. Uh, and of course, the, the risk is not static. So the numbers that we're going to show you, and, and the, I hope the conversation that we'll have today, uh, will really focus um, you know, on our, our present understanding of the risk, but also how that understanding um, is evolving. Of course, a number of drivers are making the risk worse. We have a, a number of factors that are impelling, as Amanda mentioned, pathogens to spill over more frequently into human populations, right? agricultural practices, land use change, um, travel, of course, spreads diseases further, um, or intensifying travel spreads diseases further once they spill over. Um, and we need uh, more and better tools uh, to track those drivers. Um, but we can also mitigate the risk potentially by redesigning uh, thoughtfully the types of systems that we have in place to detect and respond to to those early outbreaks and early spillover events before they explode into pandemics. 
um, and um, Robert and Christine and colleagues at ARC are doing um, are doing extraordinary work in that regard. So um, what we'll do then is, if I can make my slides advance, show you some data on um, epidemic frequency and geographic distribution, talk a bit about temporal trends and geographic trends as we see them, and then focus a bit on um, simulated events, frequency losses, um, how we generate those numbers. Uh, my colleague, Nicole, will, uh, will take you through um, a quick methodological um, primer on that, and then uh, some estimates of the benefits of early action to mitigate pandemic risk. So the historical story, um, is a busy one. It's been a busy decade epidemiologically. So we've had multiple Ebola virus epidemics, um, epidemics of extraordinary duration and ferocity, much worse than what had been observed uh, previously. Um, COVID is not the only coronavirus that we've contended with. There's been sporadic continued MERS transmission um, in the Middle East. Uh, also, of course, a, a very large epidemic that exploded in South Korea. And COVID is not even our only pandemic of uh, this decade. Or the, um, uh, we've kind of dealt, you know, in, in the 2015-2016 span with, with Zika virus, um, which exploded um, around the world and impacted Latin America really heavily. So we have this drumbeat of events um, impacting us over and over again. Um, so is the risk increasing? If so, at what rate? How do we know? Um, so to answer these questions, we looked at historical data on patterns of spillover, focusing on a set of priority pathogens to try to characterize uh, what's happening over space and over time. Um, to do that, we turned to a database of about 2,600 historical outbreaks um, goes back to 1918. The coverage is densest, though, from 1960 to the present, when um, surveillance systems were sort of beginning to be tuned to pick up these types of events. Um, we don't include everything in this analysis. That's an important caveat to put up front. We focus on um, diseases which spill over uh, directly from wildlife hosts to humans. We're not focusing here principally on, on vector-borne and diseases that are not endemic in humans. And influenza is not part of this analysis. Should note that influenza is a, a critical pandemic threat. Dean has done um, really important work on that. And I, I think we'll discuss it today. Um, we, I'll just say we don't focus on it in this analysis, but we find similar patterns of increasing influenza spillover, um, even though the surveillance systems we have to, to monitor, to characterize um, influenza look quite different to those we use for um, other zoonotic um, threats. Um, so we focus here on epidemic coronaviruses, filoviruses, Ebola, Marburg, Nipah, Machupo, a variety of things which go uh, bump in the night and, um, and find a widely increasing uh, both frequency and severity. So on the right uh, chart displays the number of reported spillover events and on the left, the, the uh, severity in terms of reported deaths. Um, these data are reported in five-year intervals. So we're trying to kind of step back and provide a really big picture view. Um, and one thing you'll note, just looking at the dots, which are the, uh, the numbers of events on the right and deaths on the left, um, is that we have this um, steady increase um, from the 1960s to the present. Some of this certainly will be attributable to improvements in surveillance. We're getting better at picking up these events. Uh, but even uh, in the very recent past, um, there is this, this uptick. And when we fit a line, that line looks um, a lot more exponential than it does, um, uh, well, than it then would be comfortable, <laughs> frankly, for all of us. Um, where uh, COVID is not included in this analysis. So, so I'll show you in just a moment when we look um, at deaths in particular um, and, and log transform on the right, um, we can see a little bit more clearly um, this pretty substantial increase in reported deaths from these events over time. Um, COVID is outside of the prediction interval for that line. And it's, it's the red dot on the far right. It's um, kind of at the upper bound of what we would expect given historical patterns, and it you know very likely will breach that upper bound because the event is is far from over, unfortunately. Um, but it's part of a broader picture. Uh, I think the central point is part of a broader picture uh, of increasing spillover, increasing mortality, increasing burden, increasing death, um, which will require increasing efforts um, to to detect, respond, and, and contain. Um, so that's the scale of the challenge that we that we see from the empirical data. Um, in terms of where these events begin and where the burden is broadly concentrated, COVID being an outlier, um, most of the events that we've, um, we've analyzed uh, here um, cluster in, in the global south. Um, so West and Central Africa is heavily hit uh, in terms of the frequency of, of spillover, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, parts of, of Latin America. So this piece of the puzzle is not, is not distributed evenly. And 
Um, of course, the same story emerges when we slice the analysis and look um, by country income group. Um, some events, some spillover events are occurring in high income countries, but broadly speaking, lower income countries are disproportionately affected by those spillover events. Um, so these countries are in a bit of a bind, right? They're the first line of defense for detecting and containing outbreaks. Uh, they also have, in many cases, the least resources available to, to do that work. Um, they're bearing the cost of providing, in a, in a way, a global public good to contain these events before they spill over more broadly um, and spread, spread across the world. Um, so, of course, the high-level panel has thought uh, very hard about what this means and how to provide incentives and resources, and I'm uh, looking forward to discussing um, some of those design questions, uh, hopefully, today. So that's the historical picture, um, increasing frequency, increasing severity. Um, we'll now spend a little bit of time talking about what we learned through simulation approaches, through computational modeling, um, very different techniques to, uh, to analyze and, um, and try to, to get our hands around um, the scale of the, the future risk that we face. Um, so we, we were asked, and we've um, been asked this a lot at uh, the Zoom equivalent of cocktail parties these days, you know, what, what, what are the odds of the next one? Um, is this really a once in a lifetime, is it a once in a couple hundred year kind of event? Um, of course, the answer matters uh, deeply uh, for how we prepare, how we finance, what the level of urgency and priority um, is uh, to, to prepare for this kind of event. Um, and for some hazards, uh, we, you know, we can turn to historical data to provide a reasonably complete answer where the patterns are well characterized, where risk isn't changing. Um, we can turn to historical data to tell us what the future is going to look like. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's not the case for pandemic risk. The historical evidence is useful to give us a sense for where things are going. Um, but of course, the big events that we're really worried about uh, in terms of pandemics are rare. Um, the observed data that we have to work with uh, are, are biased. We're missing sometimes quite systematically uh, from the historical record uh, data, which is really critical to characterize the risk. Uh, and the risk is not stationary. Um, so to handle these kinds of problems, we turn to computational modeling. And to tell you about that, I will turn to my colleague, Nicole. Um, so this slide um, kind of is, is meant to lie, lay out why simulation modeling is um, so important to quantifying risk and why quantification of risk of this type is so difficult. Um, and this is because um, in this graph, you can see um, we have um, the severity on the x-axis and probability on the y-axis. So this is a distribution of severity of um, pandemic risks. And this is just a hypothetical distribution. Um, but you can see that there is a lot of variation in severity. And you have this portion of normal losses over on the left-hand side. Um, and so these are your um, more frequent, um, smaller epidemic events. Um, you know, they happen, you know, every year to every few years, um, you know, depending on the disease. Um, but then on the right hand side in that red area, you have your catastrophic losses. Um, and these are what are known as our black swan events. Um, and these events are very rare. Um, they're difficult to quantify because we don't have a lot of historical evidence um, of their size and severity. Um, so they're underrepresented in the historical data and the sample size is very limited. Um, but they have a large influence on the expected losses that we see um, from events um, and very much impact um, our, our lives like we're seeing now. Um, so they're definitely the ones that are going to cause the most disruption and the most loss of life. Um, and so, our um, simulated event catalogs rely a lot on the historical scientific data um, to inform um, parameter estimation. So we're creating um, catalogs of simulated epidemic events um, in order for us to get a better understanding of um, the risk of pandemic events and um, the estimated losses. And they help us to fill in the gaps in the historical data by um, providing more robust view of the potential outcomes of epidemic events. Um, and they allow us to account for trends over time, as well as improve our understanding of tail risk like we saw in the previous slide. Um, and why these are so important. So if you're looking at the historical record, um, you know, over 
the past um, 50 plus years, um, we've had 53 historical filovirus events. So that's Ebola in Marburg. Um, we've had three novel um, coronavirus events and um, five pandemic flu events over the last 100 years. So that's a really limited amount of data on which to base um, estimates. Um, However, the model catalogs that we create for these diseases contain hundreds of thousands of events. Um, they account for changes in population over time, um, changes in uh, mobility and medical advancements. So, you know, if you're thinking about something like the 1918 pandemic, um, you know, if a pathogen such as that, or if a pandemic influenza event with similar characteristics occurred today, it would occur very differently than it did um, 100 years ago because mobility patterns are very different. We have different medical technology available to us. Um, and so we can use simulation modeling to understand what those difference, differences would look like um, if such an event occurred today. Um, and so when we're modeling these events, um, we're taking both a probabilistic and perspective view of what could happen. Um, and so when we're thinking about probability, um, we are able to calculate the likelihood of different outcomes of epidemic events. Um, you know, there's an infinite number of potential outcomes um, and there is significant um, uncertainty in what outcome may occur. Um, and there's lots of factors affect affecting disease transmission, um, such as behavioral patterns, political decisions, super spreading, um, that just causes a lot of variation. Um, but we use um, probability distributions and we may not know which outcome will occur, but we can estimate which outcomes are more likely to occur, um, which gives us a lot of information about what could happen. Um, also, we're doing this prospectively so um, we can assess what are the potential scenarios that we may see in the future. Um, and this really helps us inform preparedness planning, such as stockpiling, um, looking at hospital capacity, as well as um, financing needs for potential future events. Um, and so the question that we often get asked is, um, you know, when is this gonna happen again? <laughs> and so a lot of what we do is um, thinking about pandemic frequency. Um, and so like we've said uh, previously, COVID-19 is not a once in a century uh, pathogen. Um, you know, we know that as of May, um, there were approximately 3.5 million reported deaths globally um, from COVID-19. And based on our simulated catalogs, um, we can estimate the annual probability um, to be between two and a half to three and a half percent. Um, and this is the chance that in an, a, a pandemic event will cause at least 3.5 million deaths um, in any given year. Um, and so we may not know what the, when the next event will occur, but we can ex estimate the annual probability of an event occurring. When we extrapolate from the annual probability, um, you know, we can get to a 22 to 28% chance in the next 10 years. And um, I think very scary number, um, 47 to 57% chance of an event this big occurring again, again in the next 25 years. Um, so these uh, estimates are in line with recent analyses um, from the literature um, and one really important thing to understand is these risks are not set in stone. They're not immutable. And um, you know, a lot of our work focuses on what can we do to reduce these risks. So we um, envision a future where the risk is much lower, um, hopefully, and where investments in mitigation efforts and surveillance and spillover reduction um, really reduce these risks. But um, based on the trends that we're seeing right now um, and based on current risk, um, you know, that it, it's, it's a really scary situation. So I think that a lot needs to change um, to help mitigate that. Um, so the disease spread modeling process um, that we do, we start with a disease spread um, model, um, create an event catalog, and then can perform risk analytics. And I'll talk about this a little bit more um, in the next slides. 
And this is really the process that we're going to to get to those um, probability estimates um, that I was talking about. Um, and so we start with um, human to wildlife or wildlife to human spread um, spillover. Um, we look at ecological niche maps. Um, and so each simulated event begins with spillover um, from a wildlife population, which are probabilistically selected. Um, we then run a disease spread model, which is a compartment model that everybody is becoming much more familiar with these days. Um, we incorporate um, mobility networks um, to simulate disease spread between populations as well as within populations. And then we also use an ep uh, epidemic preparedness metric um, to help us understand better how different countries um, respond differently to um, pandemic threats based on their capacity. Um, these then simulations create our model catalog um, through probabilistically selected parameters. Um, and this will then enable us to create a probabilistic view of risk. And from here, we can calculate the exceedance probability as well as expected value or average annual losses. Um, and so exceedance probability um, is something that's probably new to many people, but it's an estimator widely used in actuarial sciences um, and historically to model catastrophic risks such as hurricanes and wildfire um, and floods. Um, and what this is giving you is the probability that a certain severity value, um, S on the graph here, will be exceeded in a predefined future time period. So for the example that I gave, where S was 3.5 million deaths, um, our annual exceedance probability was 25 to 3.5%. And so here, um, these are based on the catalogs that we've um, modeled and created. Um, so pandemic flu, coronavirus, and viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, and you can kind of see here the breakdown um, with pandemic flu being the biggest driver of expected deaths that we will see over the next decade, um, followed closely by coronavirus, coronaviruses, which we're experiencing now, and um, a bit further behind that, the viral hemorrhagic fevers. Um, and so that can be seen um, in the middle column of the table. And then in the right-hand column of the table, um, we can see what um, the number of deaths averted over the next 10 years will be um, due to a 1% reduction um, in spillover. Um, and so kind of see the trade-off um, or benefit of different preventative actions here. Okay, um, and I will turn it over to Ben again at this point um, to, to wrap it up, I think. Sure. Um, so uh, what, what's next? Uh, unfortunately, continued risk, uh, probably a surprise to, to no one on the line. Um, so we have the historical trend of increasing um, spillover frequency and increasing event impact. Um, we have, uh, unfortunately, a, a pretty clear picture of uh, where a lot of that risk falls. Um, where the impacts are at least proportionately most acute. Um, and we have a sense from um, really good work done by virologists and epidemiologists who are studying um, zoonotic diseases that um, there's a, a great pool, a reservoir of unknown unknowns out there, um, which need to be characterized and understood um, ideally well before they spill over into human populations. Um, so we're going through something uh, gut-wrenchingly uh, difficult, right? a humanitarian catastrophe that's setting back development quite significantly um, around the world. Um, and the story is not over for this event, and, and others are, are not just possible, but likely. Um, that's right, the bad news. Uh, but of course, um, a lot of good news. So through all of this, um, all this suffering over the past year, we've certainly developed a clearer picture of the kinds of things we need to do to mitigate events once they occur. Um, ideally, we can move substantially upstream to develop a clearer picture of um, some of the parameters and that Nicole showed you, um, some of the kind of intervention points that can be um, possibly seized to, to kind of mitigate or reduce the drivers of disease spillover and transmission once diseases do spill over. And there are opportunities on the table um, to change the incentives for the way that we um, surveil and detect outbreaks, the imperatives to report them, um, and opportunities to build much stronger incentives for early action to contain outbreaks before they explode into epidemics and before they spread. Um, that'll take you know, substantial changes in the way we work um, hopefully the kind of evidence that we've walked through can provide a piece of that picture 
um, there's a lot more, a lot more to be done beyond that. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll turn back to Amanda and to colleagues. Thank you, uh, Ben and Nicole. Um, and you know, the, 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 the numbers are scary, but I think the most important message from this is the importance of knowing what's ahead and being able to understand what drives these risks and therefore also to take um, measures to mitigate. Um, so now, uh, speaking of a, an applied example, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Robert Ayarko. Uh, who works with the Africa Risk Capacity, ARC, the Special Agency of the African Union, that's trying to better measure these risks in Sub-Saharan Africa and develop some policy solutions. So over to you, uh, Robert and Christina. Uh, thank you very much, Amanda, and thank you to Ben and Nicole for setting the scene. So uh, clearly, um, it is difficult to predict uh, what is going to happen uh, next, but what we can all say is that um, there is the danger and we should prepare for. So our presentation will look more on what we need to do and the preparations uh, that needs to be in place for us to better respond to uh, the future uh, uh, pandemics, epidemics, and even the one that we are dealing with. Uh, next, please. The next slide, yeah, sorry. The Africa Risk Capacity is a specialized agency of the African Union. And what we do is to support member states with uh, disaster risk management. And by um, this, we mean helping countries to understand the risk that they face for different perils and also offering countries the opportunity to either retain uh, risk or transfer the risk to the market. So we work in the area of drought um, and uh, also tropical cyclones and the uh, disease outbreaks and epidemics is one area that we are looking into uh, to launch a, a product for. Uh, since 2015 from the West Africa Ebola crisis, um, it has been made clear that the, uh, the, the continent needs to prepare itself and COVID has even heightened this need. Um, next slide, please. So um, how have the world been responding to outbreaks and, and epidemics and pandemics? Uh, there are any disease outbreak, uh, whether it's responded to or not, will run its course as the curve shows on the epidemic phase, and at some point will abate uh, after it is run out of, of, of people to infect and, and also um, if it's responded to. Uh, but what is important is where the interventions take place. And I think we have seen from previous either HIV and AIDS or Ebola or all the other ones, including COVID, that the later the intervention, um, the more damage uh, we have. So we are looking at what are the options currently uh, globally for response to uh, outbreaks and epidemics. And you have mechanisms that are available to countries such as the IMF World Bank uh, um, facilities that you can see, but these are more debt relief um, and balance of payment support that helps countries uh, when they have an experience these shocks to be able to bounce back. Then you have a few uh, products or mechanisms that helps the agencies, which is either WHO or OCHA themselves to get onto the field and, and support countries. We had a pandemic emergency facility by the World Bank, uh, which currently uh, is no more the PEF. And so um, there is a, kind of a, a gap that is emerging. And even when the PEF was uh, in place, there was still a gap around the resources that country need to intervene much early in an epidemic or, or an outbreak. And our experience on the continent, be it in Guinea or, or in Uganda or in DRC shows that often countries' own ability to get onto the, the field early is a challenge. Uh, so this is where we are targeting a product uh, that will uh, support countries. Uh, next slide. Right, so the, the essence of the outbreaks and the disease, uh, outbreaks and epidemics product is really to help countries in four core areas. One is to provide um, predictable funding so a country ensures itself um, at an agreed trigger, a parametric uh, trigger. And when that kicks in, the country gets uh, a payout based on a contingency plan and agreed response strategy, and the country will be able to quickly to uh, get onto the, uh, the, the, the field and start acting. Uh, 
So this early action then helps to, to suppress the curve or cut the curve as the, the term has emerged. And it becomes a catalyst for countries to mobilize additional resources uh, when needed, because then they would have some initial capacity to respond themselves, other technical partners and donors can support them. And this eventually helps to reduce the uh, impact of, of, of the outbreak. Next. Right, uh, but to respond to disease outbreaks and epidemics, there are a number of areas that we need to look at. And Ben and Nicole has uh, shared some with us, but if we were to split them into areas, windows to look at, then I would say four core areas come to mind. One is understanding of the risk that a country is facing or the continent or a region is facing. So it is important to have a good sense of the risk profile of the, the country, the pathogens, the known and then the probable pathogens and have a sense of how um, the, uh, the, the frequency and then also the severity of, of these and how you can respond to them. It is also important to have some planning and response arrangements around the contingency. If it happens, how are you going to respond to them? And countries must cost them so that they have a sense of the budgetary needs uh, and have funds available. And if not, then you do your risk transfer and, and uh, buy an insurance to safeguard when these occur. Modeling, as the Metabiota team has shown, is quite fundamental here because this helps you to understand uh, the, the spark and the spread and then also the potential impact when you have done some modeling around the pathogens that you'll be dealing with. And of course, the risk transfer mechanism is the fourth area that app works in. For the product that we're talking about, we are looking at Ebola, Lassa fever, Marburg, and meningitis, um, which uh, the map shows the areas which lie in, in the danger zone or the regions around for the continent. So these are the four that we are starting with, and we are working with Metabiota and other others to um, to complete the work around this to provide an insurance product for the African countries. Next, please. Right, the work we're doing is in partnership uh, with, with two countries as a start, which is Guinea and Uganda as the pilot countries. And then we have others um, that have been supporting us either in the technical space with Africa CDC, uh, Metabiota I've mentioned and uh, health systems, uh, group in, in Nigeria, and then we have donors such as the Rockefeller Foundation and the Swiss Development Corporation, including other partners either in the academia or capital markets who are willing to take on the risk and, and support countries with this insurance. So this is in, in short what we are planning as what needs to be done or one of the things that needs to be done for countries to better respond to disease outbreaks. And my colleague, Christina, will take you through the mechanics of how we, we are producing the product. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, and, and I'll take it over here to, to talk about how we're using the models that are available to us. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the partnership uh, between ARC and Metabiota. So um, it, uh, it was the first step into building the ARC disease spread model. Um, Metabiota partnered with ARC to, to use their stochastic uh, SCIR model and include um, personalized uh, view of human mobility network and especially the ARC preparedness index into uh, estimating and simulating different event severity. Uh, as, as Robert mentioned, the first uh, pilot countries were Guinea and Uganda. And uh, for the first time, we went beyond national uh, view of, of results. And so this model has an app new one, which is the, the first subnational level um, and follows four different pathogens. The ones that were identified to be the most um, um, relevant from an exposure point of view for these two countries. So we are talking about Ebola, Marburg, Lassa fever and meningitis. Um, and the, the simulated event, event catalogs produce both uh, high and low frequency events. What is very innovative here is, first of all, we're, we're using all the computational capacity that we have currently to simulate uh, this model para pandemic risk. But we're also incorporating elements of preparedness um, that informs the response capacity and that will, will influence the event severity. You've seen the, the picture on the left side, uh, and it's uh, a proof that we have been working together. 
Um, but the epidemic risk modeling didn't uh, happen in, in a silo. It's actually uh, surrounded by the, the risk profiling that was done for countries. So an extensive team of, of people uh, from Metabiota, from ARC, and also the technical teams in countries helped build um, the, uh, helped collect the data that supported this personalized risk modeling. Uh, we, um, we have created an epidemic database of historical events for, for the covered pathogens and looked at what are our options in terms of uh, the reporting sources. Um, I will come back to this, but this is uh, not at all a trivial uh, matter when we want to ensure pandemic risk. Um, because reporting, uh, depending on, on the, the country's capacity on one side, but also um, the, the state of, of reporting capacities globally, we will have a big role to play when we want to build a risk transfer product. Um, and, and the risk models uh, have simulations which were produced uh, by disease uh, and also, of course, by, by, by country. Um, and What's important is we start from these event catalogs, but then we turn them into a risk analytics tool. Um, and we did this with Metabiota, then we took it over and we, we are trying now to transform it into ARC's um, interface that will be given to countries for them to understand their exposure. Um, this, uh, this platform of risk analytics is as important as the model because um, we are talking about innovation in the, in the pandemic modeling space, but countries need to understand the power of these results. And um, very often we, we are treating models as, uh, as unrealistic views of reality. They show the tail risk. So we are talking about extreme events. So there needs to be a lot of a capacity building on the country side as well to adopt and to, to use as much as possible the, the results. And uh, this is one of the biggest lessons learned from previous pandemic um, risk transfer products. Uh, building country ownership is critical and it has to happen very early on. Um, these are um, just um, examples uh, which are, are going to be updated. These are from our first iteration. But just to give you um, a, an image of what kind of events we are talking about and um, how they are growing uh, in terms of severity. So we're talking about these two countries, Guinea and Uganda, and all the events you're, you're seeing here are in theory uh, suitable for risk transfer. These are simulated events from our catalogs for Ebola. And you can see that um, in, in Guinea and Uganda, it's um, uh, pretty likely to see uh, small events, but then the larger events will have a very small return period. Th those are the catastrophic extreme events, the black swans that Nicole discussed. And those are events which can explode easily and, and produce a lot of spillover also into neighboring countries. So um, we want to make sure we, we cover them for, for the country uh, that will be the pilot country, but we want to make sure that uh, points of entry and aspects related to points of entry are also taken into account in the model. Um, very briefly about the preparedness index, I mentioned that this is one of the innovation of, um, of the partnership we had with Metabiota and what we want to incorporate in the product. Um, is the fact that we are not just simulating um, uh, the behavior of these diseases based on epidemiological characteristics, but we're also including measure of, of preparedness, which will influence the outbreak severity either by um, decreasing, by increasing, sorry, the time to reaction. So the time to intervene uh, from the government side is a parameter that is being used by the model. A lower preparedness index, a uh, less prepared country, will take longer to intervene. And in turn, this will increase the spread of the disease and its severity. Another aspect where the preparedness index is taken into account is the uh, CFR, so the mortality rate of, of, um, of a given pathogen. And in a similar way, uh, a, a low prepared country will take longer to respond or will have lower capacity in hospitals to treat and isolate patients. So this in turn will lead to higher mortality. You see that the preparedness index is, um, is very rich in terms of uh, the indicators it's following, and it's going from surveillance response, lab capacity, which are most typical ones we would see, and we would see also in other preparedness indices out there, 
but it, it has this view on, on risk communication and governance, which are critical elements. And we've seen it in, in COVID probably more than ever. Um, it's, uh, it's not enough to have the tools to respond. It's also a matter of who's responding when and is the trust in the government and in the government institutions there. So will population follow um, what's being communicated to them? And lastly, um, again, non-trivial is the financing piece. So how can a country improve its preparedness constantly? Uh, and we are looking at health expenditure and so on. Um, this preparedness index, uh, this is the last thing I'll say about it, is um, really being done country by country. There is a methodology behind, but the data collection happened at the country level, at the subnational level even. And um, it's pathogen specific as well. So it's the first of its kind, which has aspects in here in what I've described, which are really pathogen specific. And so it, it, we will have a different preparedness index for Ebola in Guinea than a preparedness index for Lhasa in Guinea. And this is, um, this is very important. It was a, a, a long process, but an incredibly interesting and, and important one for country ownership and for the risk profile. Um, very quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about reporting. Um, as I mentioned, the, the reporting sources and the, the index, the data index we would use to follow in terms of an outbreak are, are critical. And we are seeing over and over in literature um, when we're looking at historical events, um, there is this mention of reporting bias. And depending on the pathogen, the reporting bias will be higher or lower. Um, for, for meningitis, we, we were discussing at length and it's pretty hard to um, confirm a case because it's, it's, a, it's a complicated medical procedure and also costly. So um, very often the, the cases will not be confirmed through the, the standard procedure. This means that a lot of cases will not be caught um, under what we call confirmed cases. So this poses all sorts of, of problems in estimating the real event severity. We have seen it, of course, in, in COVID. So there's no, no surprise that we're talking about under-reporting or actually reporting bias in, in, in what it is the pandemic modeling space. What are we going to do with all, this, all these models um, and, and their application? Well, we believe that engaging with country earlier, uh, having the risk profiling and then, and then building the analytics that, that come from the modeling will ensure that the capital markets and and uh, the investors will trust these models enough to, um, to cover the pandemic risk in a similar way that we are covering natural catastrophes with, uh, with a lot of certainty in, in, the, in the models out there. So this is uh, still um, a very young uh, market, the pandemic risk financing market. Um, there was one transaction before our, the PEF transaction, and it went to market and it paid out in COVID. Um, and this is where we're going as well with, with the ARC transaction, uh, trying to diversify the financing sources that, um, that can support the ARC ONG product. Why we're doing it? So on one side, we wanna we wanna diversify the, the financing sources, as I said. But secondly, we observe over and over again positive externalities of using the private sector as a, as and its and its um, practices as levers for a public sector transaction. So we're talking about how we use the mechanics of, a, of insurance at the end of the day in a positive way to create the the kinds of behaviors we need for insurability. So um, for example, underwriting, I'll take one, uh, the eligibility for cover of a country sends a signal to a market um, that the mandatory onboarding process that Robert described, the risk profiling, the contingency planning has happened. And the country has done all the efforts prior to signing the contract um, and is ready to go when, when there will be an event and financing will also kick in. Um, Similarly, claims, um, earlier claims, so the trust of an insurance company or an investor to release funds early on in an outbreak means they also trust the receiver to use them properly. And what is more, the share of the amount, the, the money that is given to a country directly is also a stamp of approval of its um, governance 
and how the money will flow to institutions down to the beneficiaries um, where it's needed. While um, an increasing share of money flowing through the humanitarian system can also send a signal that the country is lacking preparedness in, in using the funds. So we, we believe that there are all these levers which are important and also they are, they are important to support investments and effort for preparedness. Um, this is my, my final slide, and it's just to explain the, the country expansion. Um, and as Robert mentioned, we have two pilots, but we are in active discussions throughout the continent um, to, to raise awareness, but also to start the process of country ownership and country engagement, which, which is not a, a, a trivial process, as I said. I want to, to thank you, uh, and I will stop here. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you, Christina. Super interesting. I think um, uh, thank you also for pointing out the preparedness index that you've been working on, which I think is uh, adds a lot of value to some of the measures that are out there and, and shows the, the way forward in terms of what's happening, as well as the attention to reporting bias that can be known pretty well ahead of time, can be measured pretty objectively. Um, and, and is so important, of course, for, for trying to predict the future. And I, obviously something quite lacking um, in many countries around the world as we grapple with COVID. So um, thanks for that. I, I will, I'm going to go to our next speaker, but um, to come back to you later, you know, as you know, the pandemic emergency facility was fairly controversial and it struggled with the triggers um, when to pay out. Um, I think in some ways that's, um, helped by the relatively well-known uh, attributes of the diseases that are focused on in the context of your work. Um, but it'd be great to hear you reflect on that. And the other thing is the sizing of the payout, what it needs. And of course, preparedness investments have something to do with that as well. Um, and I, I liked your attention to the incentives related to the market. Um, you know, Of course, we could have a contingency fund or a stabilization fund available for all kinds of disaster risks that, that governments face um, could be helped by external sources. But as you say, it doesn't create some of the virtuous incentives that being able to price this risk in the market might bring. Of course, it's quite challenging. But anyhow, on that note, I want to turn next to uh, Professor Dean Jamison. I, I wonder if you could, you've done this, this work earlier on pandemic influenza risk. I wonder if you could just say a few words about that earlier work and then um, what you've seen here in the presentations from our colleagues from Metabiata and ARC today and sort of your reflections on where this field of modeling pandemic risk needs to go, where, where the science of pandemic risk study needs to go. Um, as well as questions that come up for you. What do, what do we do, what do we know and not know? I think you're really uniquely placed to be able to reflect on those issues. Thanks, Dean. Uh, well, Amanda, thanks, uh, thanks very much. And thanks to the presentation so far. I've, I've been uh, thinking about these uh, issues for quite a while. And uh, I must say it's, uh, always pleasing to be able to learn a lot more in a short period of time. So I do thank uh, uh, Ben and Robert and uh, their colleagues. Um, the origin of the particular uh, paper that Larry Summers and Victoria Fan and I did on the expected loss uh, from influenza arrest uh, was really very much uh, in Larry Summers's reaction to um, a Lancet commission that he and I co-chaired on uh, investing in health. And in that commission, in the commission's report, we did go at some length, this is in 2013, into pandemic risk and argued that that was much underappreciated. Larry's reaction after the fact uh, to the way we'd looked at it was that we hadn't paid nearly enough attention to pandemic risk. And so he um, began to lean on me to uh, take that a little further. So that was the origin of the paper. Um, looking around um, at where do we get a sense of the magnitude of risk? How do we characterize it? Um, I was disappointed in most of the epidemiological literature, which I'm not terribly familiar with, so it was new literature to me. Um, that it didn't 
answer questions that I thought were central to thinking about long-term risk. And then I came across the work of um, Metabiota and um, AIR company that's also in the catastrophe risk modeling. Um, and both these companies um, have very substantial private sector clients, insurance companies for obvious reasons, but also um, country companies that could be at substantial, more than typical risk from uh, a pandemic. And the catastrophe modeling that Nicole just described um, it seemed to me to fit exactly the needs that we were looking for. Now we can argue a lot about um, how those portfolios, how those or models get collected and that those arguments will certainly continue. But it was, um, it was very useful to do that. Um, so there were several conclusions and as I've looked back on that paper from four or five years ago that uh, I think we got right and certainly some that we got wrong. Um, one that we got wrong was an explicit conclusion that most of the expected loss lay in pandemic influenza. And as we sometimes characterized it among ourselves, um, that was um, snow white. And then there were seven dwarfs, things like uh, Ebola, and coronavirus, Marburg, and so on. So um, we got that quite wrong, uh, drawing on the literature that was unavailable, but quite wrong. Um, the other major conclusion, a non-quantitative conclusion, it's about um, risk and the losses from risk, were um, first that a great proportion of expected loss lies in the right tail, the black swans that Nicole referred to. And how you model that black tail, uh, how you think about the black tail, that fat tail, uh, is enormously determinative of one's sense of expected loss. So the, the numbers that our earlier paper came to on the expected influenza loss um, were two or three times uh, the numbers that um, were just presented and that the uh, high level panel used. Uh, and that was substantial because we treated tail risk in a somewhat different way. What's right, what's wrong, I'm not sure. But tail, the tail risk drives things. The assumptions you make about tail risk really uh, drive things um, very, uh, substantially. Um, so the con conclusions were first that the catastrophe modeling was very much from an economist point of view, the useful way to look at it were, were um, basically two institutions working on that. I hope there are more now, but I, I'm not sure. It's encouraging that the African uh, CDC, the African VARC are are um, adopting um, these modeling approaches. Um, the comments that I would make um, about the presentations today um, draw mostly about finance and how to think about finance. And they, they draw uh, partially on the concept that a lot of the risk lies in the tails and um, partially on the concept that there are really three distinct types, in my view in a way, three distinct types of financing needs. And the instruments, uh, the best instruments for responding uh, depend very much on the type of need. Uh, the first need is um, preparedness. Uh, what you do before you have any problem, uh, what you do in terms of trying to interrupt the sparks from um, animals uh, to man, to um, in put in place the surveillance systems that will catch things early. And I'll, I'll touch a moment uh, later about how important I think that is. I've, I've become rather less convinced that that's important in terms of the experience with COVID. 
Um, but so there's that preparation finance. Then there's response finance. What do you do after something has started? How do you uh, start to put in place the treatment mechanisms, the ways of interruption, further transmission, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the development and uh, applications of vaccines, um, the whole range of responses to deal with the pandemic, to close it off as quickly as possible, to minimize in a direct way the medical damage to um, treatment to the extent or supportive care to the extent that that can be made to work. So that's financial need number two. That's much more substantial, uh, but it's probably much more substantial and um, is then very contingent on where the needs are um, because you don't know that until after the fact, after the pandemic has occurred. And the third type of financial need uh, is reconstruction. After the pandemic is over, after an economy has been badly hit uh, by a pandemic, what needs to be done to help put things right? And um, here, I think <clears throat> some of the notions of insurance uh, and the engagement of the private sector may begin to make sense. But um, the financial needs in each case <clears throat> are, I think, quite different. But let me pose the question of, you have a country, um, a medium-sized, um, low-income country uh, that has simply not done the job of preparation. Its surveillance system <clears throat> is out of whack. It hasn't done anything uh, that could be done to interrupt the, um, the sparks, to, to quell the sparks. It, it has done nothing that one might think useful to do uh, to prepare uh, or reduce the risk of or to, to have early response to a pandemic. So that, but then the pandemic starts there. And what is the right response to the world? Well, one response to the world is, let's say if you have insurance, well, look, these people didn't meet the requirements of um, uh, prudence and um, foresight and um, adequate planning. They didn't meet those requirements that they certainly should have met. So we aren't gonna help them. That's the nature of the insurance contract. Well, I think we, to me, that's crazy because the rest of us suffer as well. As soon as the, the infection gets out of that country and moves elsewhere, um, everybody else is suffering too. So the right response to all of that inadequate preparation is to help them as absolutely much as possible, as quickly as possible to, to get the pandemic shut down. So that's the exact uh, opposite of insurance. That's kind of creates a very, um, standard set of disincentives, but I think one wants to simply live with those disincentives. So mechanism, the financial mechanisms there need to be able to respond in different locations quite quickly. And quite quickly, the, the PEF was the exact opposite of anything we could call quick. So what, whatever lessons we could learn, can you make that quick? Maybe you can. But the, the, the response times for COVID-19 were weeks that made a difference. Thailand had put in place a response mechanism by January 5, a week before, before the first death. They helped get things under control. They did, and they still do, despite the problems they have. They're still pretty well under control. Um, Europe and the United States had weeks or months that they wasted, but it's weeks that they wasted or months. So the kind of value of the early information um, seems quite uh, limited, the possibility of using very early information to trigger uh, insurance seems to me quite unlikely. Would you want to trigger, could you trigger insurance before that first death? The first death in China in really 9th or 10th of January after China, after three or four Asian countries had already substantially mobilized. Could an insurance company uh, handle it. So the third um, level of insurance, the reconstruction, um, not insurance, reconstruction financial needs uh, do seem to me to be more plausibly uh, met by insurance. That um, 
there the payout, whether it's a public sector payout through IDA or other uh, public mechanisms or private sector payouts through some prearranged uh, uh, insurance mechanism. First off, th there's not nearly the timeliness question. There is a more obvious set of uh, judgments about whether the country had done what it should do to prepare, whether the country had done what it should do to inform the world of what was going on. So all of those judgments could be made in a way that uh, could allow a, an insurance mechanism to be in time and to, and to have the insurance mechanism be incentive compatible with the needs in the world. Uh, so uh, as we think about insurance, as we think about finance, as we think about the role of public sector finance, I think, in early preparation. Um, I, uh, to me, that distinction among financial needs and the very sharp differences in financial instruments that flow from that is one of the things that I'm taking away from, from these comments and from the recent history um, of uh, COVID and PEF. Thanks, Dean. Well, I might ask you, what about insurance to private firms for pandemic risk? That's another, of course, governments need to respond. And as you're signaling, there might be other ways to handle the financing for those kinds of uh, preparedness and immediate response. But private firms might also create um, insurance for these firms is probably important. Uh, I think on a, in an earlier meeting that some of us were involved in, uh, someone was mentioning, you know, certain ho hotels in South Asia have had to close multiple times over the past decade due to these kinds of outbreaks, and they have business interruption that has costs associated with them, and they would actually be an interesting uh, constituency to bring pressure on governments to do better on preparedness because they're facing the costs of dealing with pandemic risk in some respects. So I'll go back to you to answer that, and maybe I'll, I'll turn back to the panelists to respond to some of the things Dean has said. But let me also ask you uh, in the audience, if you have questions for the panelists to please submit them at events at cgdev.org or tweet at us at cgdev or hashtag cgdtalks or you can submit your comments below the YouTube broadcast as well. We'll be monitoring that. So uh, let me go back to you, Dean, on this question of private firms and then we'll go back to uh, Christina and Robert, Nicole and Ben. Well, um, I, I do think it's a rather different situation as you're suggesting. Um, private firms with their own money and the judgments they can make about risk based on what their reading of the literature uh, and the terms offered by insurance companies, the private companies can uh, make their own judgments about buying insurance. It depends on how big they are financially, how much they can self-insure, how much they need to go outside. So I think there is probably a realm there. Um, and I think you rightly suggest that both the insurers and the insured in that private environment will have incentives to press governments and international agencies to reduce the risk, reduce therefore the cost of insurance. Um, but that's um, quite different because that's all private money and private decisions. Once you get into massive public subsidy, then the question of whether that public subsidy is best um, run through private sector entities with frankly, all the slowness they have demonstrated and the need on their part, since these are hard to insure risks for taking a very, very big bite out of the public sector's money. I think it's a totally different picture uh, between the public and private sectors. Absolutely, and, and, and we probably need to, to also look at the private sector, uh, however, the, because I mean, the public sector then is on the line for sort of covering both insurers and the uh, private firms for, for the losses that they've incurred as a result of, the, of, of this not being uh, well contained. Let me go back uh, to you, Ben, Nicole, Christina, Robert, to comment on Dean's comments, if you have any. And I should also say, you know, please feel free to comment. You know, we use, you can use pandemic risk for different purposes, pandemic risk modeling and understanding that. One is to understand and size um, the public sector, the public subsidy, as Dean is suggesting, what's needed. Um, and that was certainly uh, the way that we were using some of your work uh, 
as part of this, uh, as input to this high level panel on financing the future of prevention preparedness and response. Um, but there are also these, these other kinds of applications. So maybe you can uh, reflect on some of that. Go ahead, right. Ben. Oh. Robert, go ahead. Should Sorry. I? Right, right. Thank you very much, Dean, for, for, for your comments. Um, quite um, quite eye-opening. But I just wanted to share with you uh, what experience uh, is, is, has taught us or is teaching us uh, in Africa on the different stages of uh, insurance response. And, and just to, I would say, uh, differ slightly with you on where insurance can come in. So um, the kind of insurance that we underwrite is strongly linked with the preparedness index. So a countries don't, uh, we don't insure countries who don't have what we call a certificate of good standard, which is that they have done a good preparedness plan. They've done all the risks that are needed and the insurance company and ourselves agree that there's a certain level of preparedness that the country has come to before they are offered an insurance. Uh, we also have in a, a, a sister product for drought uh, been able to provide countries with about 67 million on early response. As soon as there's a drought and you can tell how severe it's going to be. So this is the kind of intervention that we feel is needed very early when there is an outbreak and not when at the reconstruction stage. And I can go back to uh, the Ebola crisis in, in West Africa, where if money had hit the ground only two months earlier, a lot of deaths would have been saved, same for, um, same for COVID. So there is a point where the intervention needs to come in for national governments themselves to be the drivers of the response and not aid agencies and development partners uh, alone. And I think that is where we want to come in. But I, uh, uh, yeah, I, I share with you the importance of the different stages of, but there is a place for uh, early intervention um, money uh, through insurance. And uh, if I ask my colleague, Christina will uh, maybe add more to that to make our point. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. If I uh, just come in very briefly, um, in, in full agreement with everything that has been said, I, I wanna just throw in there another question, maybe a rhetorical question, but I'll try to also answer is, is every pandemic uh, or every pathogen in, has the same needs in terms of, do we always need money early on? Or sometimes we just need strong surveillance and interventions, which are, as Dean rightly said, being built beforehand. So I guess the question becomes, uh, shouldn't we also understand the kind of response that's needed before going and ensuring any and every pathogen out there? And I think that's also the discovery work that has happened um, both in PEF and ARC, um, because we, we try to understand uh, what's the exposure, what's the real exposure for countries, but also where and how this money is needed. Um, and, and meningitis is a good example. Uh, meningitis is um, a disease to which we respond with vaccination campaigns. And those vaccination campaigns have an element of humanitarian support, which is not paid by the countries. But then there's the whole deployment cost. And that's where we need to step in. So understanding this fine line of where money is needed is not just a matter of we need money. And I totally agree that this is not the, the right approach. And COVID showed us a very different lesson again, um, where countries who had some memory of the past also behaved pretty well early on, which were not our first bets, say, uh, of, of, the, of the whole world. And they proved that preparedness is also learning from other events, from other countries, from other mistakes potentially that have happened. And um, maybe on, on the insurance topic, one thing to say is, well, luckily the insurers don't get to decide uh, to what event they answer when the event happens. I think the prerogative of insurance when we use it is it gets to decide who it insures, but once it decided it insures, then I think, and not, not that I think, I know, they are bound by the contract to respond. So, that choice happens with help of tools such as risk profiling, preparedness plans, contingency plans, ideally. Uh, it, not, it doesn't always happen, but it also transpires into the private sector. So uh, this concept of underwriting happens also for policies that could be sold to, to businesses. 
uh, and there we are talking about business continuity plans. There we are talking about their risk management. So depending on the type of sector, the approach is the same, but then the tools we're using to inform the approach uh, might be different. Um, and then maybe I'll allow Ben and Nicole to step in. Go ahead. Looking at Nicole to see if she wants to go first. I'll, I'll dive in, I guess. Um, I, I think um, maybe on, on Dean's points on, um, on the modeling. So th this has been, um, you know, a, a small field. There are a couple of, um, you know, central people and teams and, uh, and networks of folks who have been working on um, epidemic and pandemic uh, modeling from a catastrophe modeling framework. Um, there's a lot to learn and hopefully a lot of growth in the field um, that will that will take place and, and hopefully you know increasing application of these tools to answering questions that are useful to governments as they think about what to plan for and how to prepare. Um, that's um, you know certainly where we see a, a lot of um, a lot of value. I mean often preparedness plans are kind of pointed at the last uh, the last epidemic or the last pandemic. Um, that forward view uh, is crucially important, particularly a forward view that encompasses the potential for tail risk. Um, on the topic of flu, um, I, I, I heard you say that you thought you and, and Larry Summers were wrong. And I mean, it, it's still, uh, maybe uh, we're not talking about seven dwarves, but, um, uh, but I think our, our kind of house perspective is to agree with you that flu is um, you know, an enormous and underappreciated threat. And all of us are sort of lulled into a false sense of security by um, you know, by seasonal flu, even though that, you know, rips through the world and kills, um, you know, large numbers of people every year. Um, something about that desensitizes us to the fact that, um, you know, that this is a virus that has you know, enormous potential to, um, to cause quite large events and, and great harm. Um, and for which our historical view is, you know, highly incomplete, um, even the estimates of 1918. And, and Dean, you've, you've written on this and thought a lot about this, uh, probably substantially underestimate the true um, the, tr the true impact. So it's, it's certainly something that we, you know, we, we worry um, a lot about in terms of, you know, where the next, um, the next impact is likely to, to come from. Um, on, the, on the topic of insurance, I think I, I share the perspective that um, it, it's really a question of what pathogens of what countries um, and, um, you know, not everything is likely to be equally insurable, but there are going to be places where um, contingent capital can can potentially solve solve some real problems. Probably would not have helped Thailand. Thailand already knew what to do uh, to move quickly and adroitly to um, to try to contain contain COVID early. But in I mean, plenty of cases, there just isn't enough money to support um, the kind of um, early response activities that are needed to get a handle on an event. And and that's because and this is another thing that uh, I've learned from you uh, that. You know, ministers of health and the kind of line folks who have to do the work are constantly facing these really painful trade-offs between today's health burden and tomorrow's potential problem. And um, swatting every event uh, becomes an expensive, an expensive proposition. So um, somewhere in the ecosystem, we have to generate a flow of capital so, so that countries can do what they need to do uh, to attend to today's health burdens, the really um, you know, painful morbidity, mortality, which is preventable in many cases, but also attend to these possible risks as they emerge. Um, and and there, um, there's just a lot of room, um, hopefully for, for experimentation. Um, but I'll, I'll stop there. It's a lot, a lot more to, to chat through together. And Nicole, um, last word is yours, maybe. Oh, I, just, I don't have much to add. So much good stuff has been said. So I'll just agree with every, what everybody said. Okay, thanks. Thanks, everyone. So following on on your last comment, Ben, uh, we have a question from the online audience. Uh, I'll just read it. Knowing the history and susceptibility of sub-Saharan African countries to future pandemics, what dramatic changes in strategy or policy or resource allocation are being pursued by African governments or the African Union to increase preparedness and response independent from outside or international donors. I mean, we've certainly seen the really interesting African Union, African Vaccine Acquisition Task Team work um, to, to, hand, to, to purchase vaccine on behalf of uh, the, some of the African nations that are members of the African Union. What kinds, and, and sort of going back to this issue of the hard trade-offs because Okay, even in the top, under the topic of surveillance, right? We're not necessarily counting all the deaths right now. Um, there's a huge investment that needs to be made just on mortality recording. 
not even to get into like the level of genomic surveillance that would be needed to understand what variants are circulating and things like that. Can, do you have any insights into that as a group? I'll, maybe I'll start with uh, Christina or Robert, um, since you're part of that team there. You're a specialized agency of the AU. Um, yeah, we are, okay, so what we know of that the African Union is doing, you've mentioned the vaccines work, but I think the Africa CDC has, is also um, working in strong areas in, in preparedness. I think it has about five hubs around the continent whose main work is to help build a regional capacity and in collaboration with WHO and other uh, uh, groups. In addition to that, also you have the regional uh, bodies such as the West African Health Organization, SADC and others. So both at the regional level and then at the continental level, there is uh, some traction. In addition to that, also a number of the countries are setting up what uh, we, uh, I mean, the emergency operation centers. I think one that comes to mind is the Nigeria CDC um, and others that are springing up around the continent. So there is uh, a, a lot of movement on, on what needs to be done. And I think the continent is doing its best to uh, prepare itself for, for, for what is coming next and also best handle what we have now. Thank you. Others have comments on that? I mean, obviously, this this panel that we have been working on on the future of financing, prevention, and preparedness does advocate for a chunk of resources really to go into supporting countries to invest in this area, recognizing that the trade-offs are 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 very hard. Um, and of course, it it has to work for existing infectious disease burdens as well as the one coming down the road. So. Organizing that, of course, is a is a huge ca uh, challenge for the international system, and we've not done such a great job uh, so far getting our act together on that. But uh, that that is the plan for the future. Let me, let me turn to a couple of other questions um, that have come in um, to Ben and Nicole. Uh, you have proposed uh, in I think particularly Ben, you had talked about something like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, you know, that's a panel that is a specialized uh, and independent UN agency that looks at the risks associated with climate change uh, and the science uh, on this. As you say, there's a lot of this that we have to, we're not able to observe empirically. We don't really understand, you know, what's the relative contribution of some of the distal determinants of pandemic risks and spillover. Um, what would you uh, tell us a little bit about that idea and, and where you see it headed? Um, I'm delighted to get to get to talk a little bit about it. Um, this is an idea that I've um, been been percolating for some time with a number of colleagues, um, uh, Casey Casey Brown and Ron Waldman, um, and it really the kind of origin of it is that um, we we were kind of looking back over the series of um, you know commissions and panels that have followed um, prior epidemics, uh, and, and there are many of them where you've had a number of you know, kind of serial health crises followed by attempts to um, to undertake systemic reform. And a lot of those panels have called um, you know, for strong investments in you know, prevention, preparedness, surveillance response, um, you know, in beating different drums, but with the kind of same, same tone um, or along the same tune. And um, we began to think that there really um, isn't um, in the pandemic space, uh, the kind of tool set we need to systematically monitor the risk to keep this in the public eye um, to build an understanding of um, the drivers of the risk, how how those are shifting, um, and and to estimate on a kind of um, on an ongoing basis um, how the risk is evolving and what we need to do um, to mitigate it in the future. Um, so we began to look for to kind of design analogies that might help us um, fill this gap, and and the IPCC um, seemed like a really primary one. Um, it's not a perfect institution; it has enormous political headwinds to deal with. Uh, but one thing it has been able to do really effectively is mobilize um, mobilize big science at enormous scale to try to come up with um, a reasonable consensus about the nature of the risk, about the cost of human activity, which are unseen in many cases. Um, and we need this kind of thinking in the pandemic space as well. And we have industries and human activities that are contributing to the risk that are producing enormous externalities that aren't priced in. Um, we have massive uh, changes to the way we organize our economic activity um, globally kind of unfolding all the time that impact pandemic risk that aren't being necessarily captured in scientific assessments of, um, of the risk on a go forward basis. Um, and because of that, we're partially blind. 
Um, so we think this is a, a really crucial gap that, that could be filled that would um, serve not just to kind of help us prepare better and to anticipate risk, um, but to make sure that uh, the public eye um, kind of stays on this threat. It, it's almost impossible to imagine now given just how bad COVID is, but in a couple of years, it's gonna be um, a terrible thing that we went through and it'll be on to tomorrow's problem. Um, there'll be many of those. Um, so having uh, some constancy of attention to the risk um, seems, seems quite critical. Yeah, and I think you know, we've really seen how having multiple modeling teams look at the same set of data uh, is so important to understand what the trajectory will be in the future. Um, and you know, even within a given country to have multiple teams looking at the same phenomena and understand what happens is, is absolutely essential. So I really like this idea. I hope we can figure out a way to get the international community to move on that. Um, in addition to the benefits of, of maintaining the visibility, you know, the IPCC, I guess they issue a report every other year that represents the scientific consensus. Um, you know, we'll see. We I, I just tweeted your your estimates of pandemic risk uh, it, or of uh, certain kinds of pathogens in the next uh, 45 years or something like that. And of course, people pick that up and they may disagree with the specific number, but that's the exact point. The point is to really engage on the data, the modeling tools, and, and to really understand what is happening. So I, I really like that idea and I hope, I hope that it moves forward. Um, we have another question, somewhat unrelated, um, that has come in that's related to monitoring and surveillance. And he's asking to what extent, I'm gonna ask two questions. So his question is to what extent does monitoring and surveillance or outbreak events or case reports depend on social media versus official sources? And how can analysis correct for the bias that could be introduced from misinformation? That's a, a sort of technical question about what your data sources are and, and, and what you might look at. But related to that, you know, um, when uh, someone was <laughs> asking me, well, what's going on with COVID-19 modeling? How, how can we talk about these other kinds of pandemic risks when it's hard for us to say what will happen in the next month and where with respect to new variants of COVID and those effects? Can you, um, in this group, I think you have a special knowledge about where I'll, you know, what do you think is the future on this? Um, uh, what, what can we hope to get better at even now during COVID? And maybe I'll start with, Dean, again, if you have any thoughts on this topic. Not much in the way of thoughts. It seemed to me that the epidemiologists have been quite good at predicting out for about two weeks and less good when you get to three or four weeks. And it's, as I said earlier, I think why I wasn't finding a few years ago, the mainline epidemiological literature nearly as interesting as the catastrophe literature, which was kind of jumping to a much longer term. So it, it's, it's, it's that for planning around COVID, it would be really nice to have good projections based on alternative policy scenarios that go out two, four, six months. That seems not to be possible. But what does seem possible when you look over a longer period, uh, the kinds of periods we're talking about for post-COVID thinking, that we do have tools uh, with many imperfections, but we do have tools that are a good deal more credible. So my, my thing is we're kind of stuck in this period between two weeks and four years. Uh, <laughs> our current discussion is about four years on. Well, maybe that IPCC group can figure that out too, but maybe Nicole, I'll ask you to come in on this question. I, I think, you know, what, what Dean is saying is right. It's in some respects, it's easier to, to be more certain about something that will happen in the next 10 to 25 years than in what was, is happening next month. But can you say something about that? Yeah, um, I think it's, you know, understanding the the difference between the forecasting modeling where that is being done and um, probabilistic modeling whereas you know in forecasting you're trying to predict a single outcome what's going to happen 
whereas in the probabilistic modeling, we're trying to understand um, the range of outcomes that could happen um, and the probability. And I think that we're much better able um, you know, to, to get an understanding of that um, versus the forecast modeling is just incredibly, um, you know, difficult. It's driven by things that are not just disease parameters. Um, it's driven by human behavior choices, political decisions, things like that, that are um, very unpredictable. Um, and so there's a challenge there, but, um, you know, I wouldn't um, want that to stop us from looking pro prospectively because I think that there's a lot to understand. Presumably we can do both at the same time. Uh, uh, Robert or Christina, do you have any thoughts on this topic? And also, I, do, I don't uh, believe that you're using social media data, so maybe I'll ask you to come back to that in a little bit, but uh, uh, Robert and Christina, do you have any thoughts on this issue? Um, very, very quickly, Amanda, so um, Africa CDC has tried a while back, back in 2018, to, to set a research program into digital surveillance, and uh, we, um, it, it's the, the most recent one that I'm aware of on the continent. Um, it was uh, the very first initiative of its kind and understanding and recognizing that in data poor environments, we should be using all the data sources that are at hand and, and understanding the noise, which is not real noise, but it's, it's really information that we could be using and, and that could help um, speed up interventions. As I was mentioning early on, preparedness, low preparedness means uh, late intervention. So whatever helps us speed up uh, very early on the interventions, I guess it's, it's a very good initiative and hoping that digital surveillance will become more of a topic um, also after COVID. I don't know if, if Ben wants to add anything here, but. Uh... Just, just to agree. Um, yeah, no, we, we use um, uh, as many different information sources as we possibly can, including social media. Um, just to map events that that might might be of interest, um, so to, to spot things, then we'll turn to high reliability data sources um, from from government to non-governmental to scientific to try to characterize events. Um, so it's good to kind of keep the antenna up, um, not fit for purpose for quantitative analysis. Can, can I ask you sort of related to this, what do you think, or, or if you had to look at the data that you're using now to construct the model catalogs and others, what, what are the big gaps and quality issues that you see in the data and surveillance today? Um, if you had a, a list of top three things you'd like to see governments and their international partners invest in, what would they be? Maybe starting with Robert. Um, I will leave that question to the uh, epidemiologist and the modelers on the team, but you had a, another question on what we need to do now, and, and if you don't mind, I would like to address that. So we're dealing with a coronavirus, which, I mean, we've seen variants of it coming up every now and then. So one area that we must, as a global community, respond to is equity in, in, in vaccinations. I mean, the longer we wait to cover the rest of the world, the danger, the more we put ourselves in danger. We've seen Delta, um, the Delta variant showing us that even in highly vaccinated areas, people are still susceptible to it. Uh, so there are a few things that needs to be done. You have the short term action, that is what I'm talking about, that countries with excess vaccines need to um, help those who don't have it. And then mid medium to long term, we need to build the capacity for other regions of the world to be able to produce and, and master the, the, the science and the technology and the capital needed uh, to put in place um, vaccine technology and then the therapeutics that are needed for that. So we can do it for COVID and that infrastructure should help us uh, with future uh, pandemics and, and COVID. But from data and the science of it, I think there are a few epidemiologists and modelers on there panel who can do better justice to that. Thank you. Okay, and you're right, because it's actually 12, 28 p.m. I was getting carried away. So I'll ask uh, who, who would like to say a few concluding statements and they can throw in a little bit about the data at the end. Um, maybe I'll go back to you, Dean. 
Well, I guess one thought that I have uh, is that compared to the IPCC, compared to the much more general range of actions concerning uh, dealing with climate change, the level of effort that's going into uh, a problem that is not probably as big as climate change, but is not that much smaller either. The level of effort is probably at the 1% level now. Um, and that conversations like this, initiatives like ARC, uh, support for the modeling, support um, for alternative modeling groups, as, as you pointed to, uh, Amanda, all of that is really, in some sense, I think, in its infancy. And we should uh, uh, be aware that uh, unless we do better, we're probably going to continue to have these problems. <clears throat> Exactly, and in, in terms of the measurable and direct effects on on human well-being, I think we're we're living it now. So maybe then, with apologies to the other panelists, I'm going to wrap up now to respect your schedules, but just to encourage everyone who's well, first to thank all of you for for great presentations and commentary. Uh, I'd say please stay tuned on this. Obviously, these are not the only two groups that work on these issues. Um, we hope to uh, convene more of the groups that work on modeling um, and looking at pandemic risk and preparedness in the next six months or so as, as a way to think about what the solutions might be for the international community. Um, so thank, thank you to everyone for joining, a really important topic and uh, please take care. Bye. Thank Bye, Amanda. Bye, all.